Good evening, everybody. see the uh, Dakota Mundi as well, kind of in the center at the bottom. You see the hawk there? He's down at the bottom of the bridge. Came to the show. Just to hear some of the music. right there. Now that the Marlon Perkins Wild Kingdom has been introduced, how are you? Glad everybody's here tonight. Watch a little bit of the sun going down here in San Pancho, Mexico. Yes, still in Mexico. Still. Your favor, Dennis Collard, ladies and gentlemen. Dennis and Kim's Casa Acantilado. You see Dennis's name say, thank you, Dennis, for the stage, for the opportunity. That's what I say every day when I wake up, and every night when I go to sleep. Thank you, Dennis, thank you, Kim. Okay, Miss Linda.
time of day here without a doubt if you ever had a front row seat to something this would be the spot Say hi to uh, to uh, Dennis. He's here tonight. Dennis and Kim, both watching. It's water, not mezcal. So far. sound really you don't hear any sound really hey Gina miles away from here but not really can you guys hear this you have sound Take the earplugs out. 
Jim. <laughs> hi, Judy. So I had a dentist. So I had a barb, Bill. The whole crew's here. Want to be a it is. That's right. Can you see it, actually? See this? This is a tire. It's a watering can. It's watering the little tree. See the rope? The rope is tied to the tree. If this little tire swing keeps sweating, just like me, all that wet, that sweat, he waters the tree, the tree's going to grow up and up and up, and this will become a tire swing. Aww, so hopeful. I miss you today. You're up in the North Country. The Redwood Curtain. <laughs> Valerie, this is San Pancho, Mexico, about an hour north of Puerto Vallarta, just up from Sayolita. You are watching the sun set into the Pacific. Quarantine anywhere. I'm so grateful to Denny and Kim for that.
Fuzzy sunset tonight. Thank you. 
had a good weekend. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it very much. You're uh, joining me in San Pancho. Mexico, north of Puerto Vallarta. You're looking towards Hawaii now, where the sun will be setting in just a little while. But in the meantime, here we are, enjoying this sunset. Mexico, right?
photons? Yes. Right. I'd like to take this time to share a little bit of some stuff I've been finding on the on the interwebs. Some words, different words. Some of you folks that tune in somewhat regularly here might have heard these before. But some of them bear repeating. I just can't help myself. The first one was, I liked it quite a bit actually. It was um, sort of a status report I, I put up the other night it was, um, I was happy to share that I had, I had finished three books, like I had finished three books today. All this extra time, now I need some more crayons. <laughs> See, it's kind of funny. All right. Right up there with what did the duck say to the waiter? He used to say, put it on my bill, but from six feet away, that's a little impossible now.
I just made that up. It sounded like it, didn't it? Hi, Ramy. So yeah, so I, I thought I'd spend a minute and go through some of the some of the musings I've read about, seen. This one I'm about to read is actually a um, a huge site of a building that they po posted. These words. Here they are. So when you go out and see the empty streets, the empty stadiums, the empty train platforms, don't say to yourself, it looks like the end of the world. What you're seeing is love in action. What you're seeing in that negative space is how much we do care for each other, for our grandparents, for our immune compromised brothers and sisters for people we will never meet. People will lose jobs over this. Some will lose their businesses and some will lose their lives. All the more reason to take a moment when you're out on your walk or on your way to the store or just watching the news to look out into the emptiness and marvel at all of the love. Let it fill and sustain you. It isn't the end of the world. It is the most remarkable act of global solidarity we may ever witness. Right? Right. That's uh, some good writing right there. Yes, indeed. Let's find another one. I could get political, but I'm not going to tonight. Doesn't feel like it. But I will say this. We fell asleep in one world and woke up in another. Suddenly Disney is out of magic and Paris is no longer romantic and New York doesn't stand up anymore and the Chinese wall is no longer a fortress and Mecca is empty. Hugs and kisses suddenly become weapons and not visiting parents and friends becomes an act of love. Suddenly you realize that power, beauty, and money are worthless and can't get you the oxygen you're fighting for. The world continues its life and it is beautiful. It only puts humans in cages. I think it's sending us a message. You are not necessary. The air, earth, water, and sky without you are fine. When you come back, remember that you are my guests, not my masters. That also is very beautiful. I have a rather long one that I'm gonna read now, but I haven't in a while. And it's, it's quite wonderful, me thinks, if I can find it. Let's see if I can find it. saved it in my notes. It's called The Gift. The Gift. And what it is, it's a note from COVID-19. An imagined letter from COVID-19 to humans. Get some water for this one. Stop. Just stop. It's no longer a request. It's a mandate. We will help you. 
We will bring the supersonic high-speed merry-go-round to a halt. We will stop the planes, the trains, the schools, the malls, the meetings, the frenetic furied rush of illusions and obligations that keep you from hearing our single and shared beating heart. The way we breathe together in unison. Our obligation is to each other, as it always has been, even if, even though you have forgotten. We will interrupt this broadcast, the endless cacophonous broadcast of divisions and distractions to bring you this long breaking news. We are not well. None of us, all of us are suffering. Last year, the firestorms that scorched the lungs of the earth did not give you pause. Nor the typhoons in Africa, China, Japan, nor the fevered climates in Japan and India, you have not been listening. It's hard to listen when you're so busy all the time hustling to uphold the comforts and conveniences that scaffold your lives. But the foundation is giving way, buckling under the weight of your needs and desires. We will help you. We will bring the firestorms to your body. We will bring the fever to your body. We will bring the burning, searing, and flooding to your lungs so that you might hear we are not well. Despite what you might think or feel, we are not the enemy. We are messenger. We are ally, we are a balancing force. We are asking you to stop, to be still, to listen, to move beyond your individual concerns and consider the concerns of all, to be with your ignorance, to find your humility, to relinquish your thinking minds and travel deep into the mind of the heart, to look up into the sky streaked with fewer planes and to notice its condition. Have you noticed its condition? Have you looked? Is it clear, smoky? smoggy, rainy? How much do you need it to be healthy so that you may also be healthy? To look at a tree, to see it, notice its condition. How does its health contribute to the health of the sky, to the air you need to be healthy, to visit a river and see it and notice its condition? Clear, clean, murky, polluted. How much do you need it to be healthy so that you may also be healthy? How does its health contribute to the health of the tree who contributes to the health of the sky? so that you may also be healthy. Many are afraid now. Do not demonize your fear and also do not let it rule you. Instead, let it speak to you. In your stillness, listen for its wisdom. What might it be telling you about what is at work, at issue, at risk, beyond the threats of personal inconvenience and illness? As the health of a tree, a river, the sky tells you about the quality of your own health. What might the quality of your health tell you about the health of the rivers, the trees, the sky, and all of us who share this planet with you? Stop. Notice if you are resisting. Ask why. Stop. Just stop. Be still. Listen. Ask us what we might teach you about illness and healing, about what might be required so that all may be well. We will help you if you listen. Well, I think it's certainly got our attention. That's for sure. Julie. I think you're on time, you're not late.
Beeping bop tonight, Karen. Bye. Uh -huh. 
I um as I sit here tonight, uh, I'm thinking a lot actually about um, uh, a gentleman that was really very meaningful in my life that passed away a couple days ago. His name was uh, Bob Garcia. Bob Garcia um, lived in Los Angeles most of his life, or a lot of his adult life. Worked for A&M Records for many, many years. Quite a bit with Herb Alpert, Jerry Moss, my friend Mike Regan. And uh, Garcia was uh, one of a kind, always had a a big slobbery dog with him. And um, when I was about 20 years old, um, living up in Eugene, Oregon, I had a friend of mine who booked the music for uh, the University of Oregon, where I was attending um, for a while. And uh, that year, uh, the police who were with A&M Records uh, came through and um, I got to meet uh, Garcia, Bob Garcia there. Uh, he would go out with the various bands that A&M Records uh, had as artist relations, the label representative. Amazing guy. So went back to LA and I started sending him uh, cassette tapes from uh, from from uh, Eugene, Oregon, and he would listen and humor me. And eventually, he said, "Oscar, because if you're going to really be serious about this, you have to actually come to Los Angeles. You uh, you're not going to be able to do that from Eugene, Oregon, sending cassette tapes." So I took it upon myself to drive down um, in 1978. Garcia took me around to a couple of clubs, a couple of shows, and had this huge room in his house full of vinyl records, listen to some records, got a huge collection. And while I was there, I went to the Musicians Union, and um, I went and I said, you know, are there any trumpet playing gigs anywhere? Um, and they said, yeah, Ray Charles is looking for a, a lead trumpet player. So here I was, you know, 20 years old and really not much of a lead trumpet player. But I said, sure, I'll go. So the next day, there I was, 10 in the morning at Ray Charles' recording studio and rehearsal studio there in uh, central L.A. And I sat there with the band and played from 10 o'clock until noon. Fumbled my way through the book, you know, the lead trumpet book. Dan takes a break for lunch, and I stay there. And during the rehearsal, uh, Ray is, was not really known for uh, a lot of patience if he didn't like something. So we were there, and he was he was pissed off at something the drummer was doing. So he says, so <laughs> so he has them take him over to the drums, and he sits down and plays the part perfectly. You know, imagine being the drummer and all of a sudden this blind guy sits down and like just nails the drum part. Can't even see one of the drum, you know, heads. Perfect. It was beautiful. And then, then everybody left for lunch and Ray was rehearsing the Raylettes. And so I stayed there, sat on one side of the piano. Across from me were the four Raylettes on the other side of the piano. And there's Ray. You know, he stops in the middle of a song and says to one of them, darling, but you know you're standing in the wrong place. <laughs> All four of them look at each other and switch places. Then later that afternoon they told me I didn't have the gig and I drove back to Oregon, but I figured, well, if all you have to do is go to the Musicians Union and, and uh, ask about a gig and you could audition for Ray Charles, I'll, uh, I'll just move there. So I moved down there and uh, Never had an experience like that again, actually. It was, it was quite interesting. I'm frozen, really. 
Is anybody else seeing a frozen screen right now in the middle of this fun little story about Bob Garcia? Do I, should I reboot it, leave and come back? Or is it only frozen in Australia? Somebody type something that says, no, no, okay, good. No, you can see and everything's fine. What does no mean? You're good, all right. So I moved down to LA and um, sort of lost touch with Garcia until I moved down there in 1979 and I, and, and I um, in 2005, I released my first album. I had met Will Ackerman. And Ackerman, um, during the Wyndham Hill years, had worked with, um, had worked with uh, A&M Records. They distributed a lot of Wyndham Hill's music. And I came back in touch with uh, Bob Garcia again. And at that time, Garcia had been very involved with the Grammy Awards and he would share music with uh, various folks in the Grammy world, try to create awareness for different artists, including me. And, you know, I would make these new age albums and, and he would always ask me, uh, sort of push me farther, you know, like, are you, are you still making, are you still making music for soccer moms or something like that was what he would say. When are you gonna play the horn, really? When are you really gonna play? You know, and he would ask all these really tough questions. He was, uh, he was amazing. And lived a long life. He, I think he was 80, 81 or something, passed away a couple, uh, a couple of days ago. So I wanted just to uh, tell Bob Garcia that uh, here in the sunset down in Mexico, I'm thinking of him. And I know there's a lot of people, especially in Los Angeles, and, around the world that knew Garcia and uh, you know how there's people in your life that you meet and you just know they're one of a kind he was one of a kind he was that guy one of those guys that every email was in all caps every single bit of it whether he was screaming or not so yeah here's to Garcia Actually, I know a song that he would have known because Chuck Mangione was with uh, Anna for a while. It's a little mini version. <laughs> story about Chuck Mangione. That song, Feels So Good, came out in the late 70s. And that album cover had a picture of Chuck like this, holding onto his horn. And I found out what kind of horn it was. And it was a Yamaha flugelhorn that he was playing. And that's what this is. This is a Yamaha flugelhorn. And I got this flugelhorn uh, sight unseen sent to Eugene, Oregon in 1977. I bought it. Um, 
And it's the same flugelhorn I play. I've played ever since, since 1977, this horn. It's a Yamaha, just like Chuck Manchon played. I have actually a funny story of how actually I, I got the money to pay for this. How many of you guys remember years and years ago, the one of those, uh, those chain letters where you would, you'd go to the party and they'd invite you to it and they'd say, okay, here's the letter, send $50 to the, to the person at the top of the list and put your name at the bottom of it and go tell two friends and everybody sends fifty dollars to the person at the top of the list and everybody gets added to the bottom so i did that and this was up in eugene oregon in 1977 uh, at the time i was um incredibly not wealthy i'm not wealthy now but i, I was incredibly not wealthy then food stamps, you know, collecting beer bottles to get the money. So I sent the $50, and all of a sudden, a couple weeks later, I get an envelope at, at the house, and there's, there's, there's $50 in it. And then uh, next day, a couple more envelopes, each one with $50 in it. And for the next month or two, I was getting envelopes with cash, $50 cash. I think one day, the biggest day was like $600 in one day. I ended up getting like $7,000 in, in money from that uh, chain letter thing. And with that money, I got this food horn, bought a car that drove me to LA and got called by the ombudsman from the University of uh, Utah, Brigham Young or something, wondering how did my name get on this letter and why is it in Utah? Of course, I said that Jeff Oster no longer lived there. And uh, you might imagine that because with any one of those chain letters, as you know, there's always somebody at the bottom that never makes it to the top, so. But I certainly enjoyed the money. It was one of those moments of, uh, of fortune. The same horn, this is the same horn from, from 1978, my friend. Yes, the Baja Cantina days, the same one from LA. Every record I've ever played on that has a flugelhorn, me playing, is this horn. It's amazing. And I guess there are better ones now, but um, this is the one. I like it.
when I first moved to LA in the uh, I guess it would be 1979 late 70s I used to take my horn up into the canyons I would go up to Mulholland Drive and look out at some of these pullovers, you know, where you can see the entire L.A. Basin. And I would just play loud, hear the echoes down in the canyons and stuff like that. It's pretty awesome. Thank you, Jay. And um, I would go into Malibu Canyon. And Malibu Canyon, if any of you have ever been in it, it's, it's really these tall uh, mountains that sort of come up as you drive through it. I used to pull off some of those overlooks and play there. And I always used to imagine um, when I'd be playing you know, my horn towards Beverly Hills or Hollywood that uh, somebody would, would, uh, would hear it. And... Um, I figure somebody did, you know, early in the morning. And I was a limo driver for a lot of years. Used to be, bring my horn with me. And while people go inside, I'd sit in the back and play. One time I was driving Dudley Moore, and I always was, um, I'd always, when I'd see the, the people coming back to the car, I wanted them to know that I was a, a horn player, so I would stay in the back of the car, still playing. One time Dudley came up and was conducting me through the outside of the car through the window. Got out and got in the front. I'd have my songs all queued up in the cassette player. When did I play in LA? I was in LA from 1979 to 1997. And I played at Rubens and Baxter's and Black Angus and weddings and bar mitzvahs and Sutter's Mill and Mission Hills and in Valencia and used to play at um, in a band called Mr. Good Rock and we would play in at uh, the, the um, uh, Six Flags Magic Mountain Lady Jane's out in Montrose and the Holiday Inn in Palmdale <laughs> I used to Stay at the Hol We'd go out to Holiday Inn and we'd go there for a month. And this was when in Palmdale, the Holiday Inn was the only thing that you would see when you drove into the valley, the Antelope Valley up there. And we'd stay there a month and I was so poor, I'd bring a camp stove. And, uh, and I would cook in my room because you couldn't afford to eat in the, in the, in the kitchen. They give you no break. And this kind of, the first band I was with that we, that we would do this with was called Off the Wall. So we would do skits to all these top 40 songs back then, just to keep ourselves uh, happy. And at that, at that particular place, one night, um, well, every night we would do, the first set would be sort of jazz, you know, like a dinner set, and then we'd do dance music. And um, <laughs> one night we said, well, let's, <laughs> one night we, we had them put a table on stage and they, they had, we had them serve us uh, uh, Cherry's Jubilee, everybody in the band, five of us. And we played a cassette tape of the band playing the dinner set from the night before. And we had a microphone and we actually had dessert on the stage while the dinner set was playing. And we passed the mic around and said how we thought how good the dessert tasted and did we like the music that was playing. That was fun. And we used to do the band, uh, song White Wedding and, and we would buy all these, these uh, uh, costumes from um, thrift stores. So with White Wedding, the trombone player, a guy named Mark Jones, used to dress up in a white tuxedo and a top hat. And I found a, an oversized wedding dress with a veil um, in um, a, a, a thrift store. And we would start the set with the wedding march um, where, where Mark and, and myself uh, would walk across the dance floor to get up on stage, him in the white tux, me in the wedding dress. And I have a veil over my face black plastic long fingernails and under the veil was a um a, uh, a rubber skull uh, a halloween mask um with a, a fish bones hanging out of its mouth so halfway through the song you know he's singing hey little sister what have you done and halfway through the song i lift up the veil and he sees the 
the mask and he freaks out. And, you know, it was a little bit of theater that kept us, uh, kept us happy. And so one, one night um, up at the Holiday Inn in Palmdale um, for a month in the middle of nowhere, in the high desert, um, you could imagine things got a little uh, uh, tweaky. So one night in my room with my camp stove, I had cooked spaghetti. And um, on the break before we came down for the set where we would do White Wedding, I didn't tell anybody in the band this, but under the mask, the rubber mask, I had put on some white uh, face paint with red lips, you know, grease paint, and those, those plastic fangs had those in my mouth. And I took a big handful of raw spaghetti and I put it in my mouth. And I held it and I didn't tell anybody about it. So, <laughs> so we come, start doing the song, and halfway through the song, I lift up the veil and freaks out. And, you know, and I don't tell anybody in the band this, and they're playing. And then a little bit longer, I reach down and I grab the mask and I start pulling the mask up and my face is all white and all this. And then I just start going. And the, the spaghetti start like worms starts, <laughs> starts falling out of my mouth onto the stage down my chest. And I'll never forget the, the bartender, there was a woman, she, she was watching, I mean, she went like this, <laughs> turned away. <laughs> and the band would just crack up. I just, I would do stuff like that. They would never, they would never know. And it was the best of it. Cause we would just, you know, play the same songs from nine at night till, until 1.30 in the morning from Wednesday until, uh, yeah. And then, and then another one of those stories, one of the ones we used to do, another song was we used to do um, Eat It, you know, the, the parody of Beat It by Weird Al Yankovic. And, you know, that one is why you have to be such a fussy young man, don't want your Captain Crunch, don't want your Raisin Bran. So we would start a set with that song, and Mark Jones would dress up as a grandmother with a gray wig and a, you know, grandmother dress. And I, I had a, a baby bib, a holiday intel that I used as a diaper, um, and literally had it looking like a diaper, uh, no pants on, just the towel with a belt around it. Um, big, puffy um, <laughs> um, um, slippers that look like pandas, you know, those kind that look like animals. I had those. And a beanie copter hat with a little beanie spin around on it. And we would start, before we would start the song, and the dance floor was empty before we would start. I would run out onto the dance floor with one of those little Fisher Price four-wheeled xylophones that you pull and it makes the thing makes that sound. <laughs> so I'd run around the dance floor, and Mark Jones would chase me, dressed as a grandmother with a with a uh, a, um, a, ro a rolling pin, and we'd I'd run around the floor, and he'd chase me, and then we'd run up on stage, and then we would start the you know. Da, 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 and whatever the that Howard starts. Why do you have to be such a fussy young man? And I had a box of Raisin Bran and a box of Captain Crunch. We would act out the song. So we would do that. You know, it was kind of funny. And after a while, you know, we would try to get bookings and, and people would say, well, we book top 40 bands. We don't book circuses. They would say that. So anyway, so one night, same kind of a thing. I didn't tell the band any of this. So I'm running around in my, my diaper and my beanie copter hat, and I had gone to the store the day before, and I bought one of those little capsules with fake blood in it, the kind that you put in your mouth and you let it melt, and um, it turns all red, you know? <laughs> so, we're, <laughs> so we're sitting there, you know, he's singing the song, and I'm there with my tray with my Captain Crunch and my Raisin Bran, and I just start going, and blood starts pour, <laughs> blood starts falling out of my mouth. <laughs> and then I like open my mouth a little more, more blood starts falling down my chin, dripping onto my, my bib. <laughs> my whole goal was to try to get the band to fall over and, 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 and um, uh, not be able to do the gig. And uh, that was always fun too. The juxtaposition of the beanie copter hat and the blood pouring out of my mouth I thought was quite uh, clever. So that was back in my top 40 days. Actually, if you go to my YouTube channel, um, I have a you know YouTube channel, Jeff Oster. Um, there's a couple of videos, not of all of that, but there's a couple of videos of my top 40 days. Um, the first one is a demo that we had shot up at the Magic Mountain, Six Flag Magic Mountain in Valencia. 
and it starts with me uh, doing some rap music. That's right, I was rapping, and I had hair down to here, that's when I had hair, and washboard abs. Now I have less hair, and I still have washboard abs, but they're, um, they're insulated. Yeah. All right. I'll play another song. I'll play Summertime. me off. Boy, he went for a ride then, didn't he? I'll start over again, <clears throat> but I digress. Let me do it on the on the trumpet, actually. This is in honor of the summertime that's coming up where maybe we won't have to wear masks out at the beach. Maybe.
All right, well, there was that. Thank you. Thank you for indulging me for that one. I like that song. Get off of me, man. This is the night of the black leaf cutter ant. And I have to tell you, if they decide you're a leaf, it's not fun. I got bit by one once and it is not fun. Big old pinchers. No Venus tonight? Oh, yes, there's Venus tonight. How about that? I gotta tell you, one of the ridiculously cool things about this place, in addition to everything else that's ridiculously cool about it, is that, especially when the moon is not super bright, um, Venus, as it sets into the ocean over there, that's Venus right there, um, shines on the water like the moon. And if the moon is not bright, it is one of the most amazing, amazing things to see the, you know, like you see the sun reflecting off the water towards you, to see, what would, what, what would it be called, do you think? Would it be called Venus light, Ven light, Ven light, Venu light? Venus light, moonlight, whatever the reflection is, it's awfully beautiful. Lucy Kantari, she of the fabulous children's group, the Jazz Cats, and her son, Darius. Darius Yo Yo Malantari, that's what we're going to start to call him. He's a cellist. I don't know how old he is now, Lucy. Five, six, eight. How old he is. Venusian. Like a Venusian blind. Um, how old, however ho old he is. Like he, um, he plays the cello. Amazingly. And the thing I'll always remember is when he was two years old, Lucy sent me a video of my uh, song, Next from my album in 2011, that's how long this is going. And there's a picture or a video of, of Darius in the living room in their place in New York, dancing, air guitar, not air, he actually had a guitar, strumming a guitar while the song was playing. It was the coolest thing ever. And he's turning into like the most ridiculous cellist. You know, Lucy does these videos and Lucy won a Grammy last year or the year before maybe. And he came up there and was holding it while Lucy's talking. It was the coolest thing. So watch for him because he's going to be more and more ridiculous. The cello, the cello guys have got nothing on him. I'll play another standard, one of the few that I have in my brain. Venus glows on the ocean. Yes, it's unbelievable. I wish they had a good enough camera to actually broadcast that because it's like, it's stunning. I'd almost say it's stellar, but it's not a star, it's a planet. <laughs> it's funny. All right, name that song. Name the song. Come on. Six notes that was. I'll play them for you again. Come on. Somebody knows. I'll do it again. Falafel from the stand across the street from your house. What's her name, Angelica? Julie, you win coffee. 
Hetty, you win a trip to Curacao. Lisa, you win a yellow lemon crested cockatoo as a pet. It went by so fast I didn't see it. Lisa, you win a all expenses paid trip to Cooper PD with a chance to mine all of the opals that you possibly can. I have another, um, have the moon straight above my head. You already have a friend with an opal mine? Oh, well then, maybe then you need to go up and collect, without touching one, a box jellyfish. Or maybe you should work so hard, like it would, all right, now you got me going. Everybody, Lisa uh, Noble's from uh, Australia, lives in Australia. Um, and I am now going to share with you all a little bit of Aussie slang. Now, I'm sure she's going to know every one of these. No cheating. Although, before I do this, I want to tell you a story. How many of you all have been down to the Virgin Islands? Um, there's a island called Tortola down there that I went to once and if you've ever been to Tortola there is a bar there named Foxy's and at Foxy's is a guy named wait for it Foxy and Foxy the cool thing about Foxy is no matter where you're from in the world if he asks you where are you from and you tell him he starts singing a song and starts including references that only somebody that actually had been to that place would know like he started singing i told him he's from los angeles he started singing about ralph's grocery store and 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 other places in la that only somebody from la would like really know about and somebody else who was from like you know whatever paris or Sweden somewhere, some little town. He would sing songs and he would know all the little bits about those places in the middle of this island, you know, foxes. It was, but I digress. Here's some Aussie phrases. Wrap your laughing gear around that. Actually, Lisa, you can, you can translate some of these. Dog's breakfast. That means it's all messy, right? It's like just a jumble, a dog's breakfast. How about, tell him he's dreaming. 
I guess that's probably when somebody asks you out, you say, tell him he's dreaming. A few stubbles short of a six pack. I guess there's a, another one that's got a couple of, couple of roos short in the paddock or something like that. Here's some other ones. Oh, it explains them. I didn't know that. Here's one. Fair go, mate. Fair suck of the sauce bottle. Fair crack of the whip. Made famous by the ill-fated former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, who enjoyed using Australian slang to speak to the electorate and often pleaded for a fair suck. I'm going too fast? Oh, okay. The phrase generally means that you want to be treated fairly. Pout it in your mouth? Dear God, I don't even want to know it. Are you going to explain that? Fair suck was coined by struggling Australian families who shared droppings of tomato sauce to flavor their meat. Laughing gear is the mouth. Oh. Oh, that's funny. Speaking of laughing gear is your mouth. I once, when I was in high school, I high school band went to, um, went on a trip to Europe. This is one of the reasons I still play today is because of this band director, Uncle Willie Ledoux, where he took 200 of us from the Coral Gables High School marching and concert band to Europe. Five countries, 16 days, concert under the Eiffel Tower. Um, Warwick Castle in London. Uh, marching through the streets of Ralta, Holland. Trip down the Danube, all this crazy stuff. Mucho ayuda el no esturba, all talk and no action. That's pretty good. So I'm in London, we were in England, Coventry. We were on some tour and I, back then I was smoking blueberry Tipolette cigars. And we were walking through the, some museum and I'm smoking one of these blueberry Tipolette cigars. And the guard comes up to me and goes, tells me to put it out. I said, well, I don't know where to put it out. He goes, put it in your munch box. And I thought he said lunchbox, but he actually said munchbox, which I guess is a bit like um, whatever that mouth thing was that you said earlier, uh, Lisa. So that was a little embarrassing. Although I have another story about that actually, which is pretty good. My father was a pretty well-read dude, and we would talk about stuff and a lot about history. He was quite into history. And um, in that same trip with the high school band, you know, we had three or four buses, and they did this tour through um, a tour through London. And we had a tour guide who would ask us all of these questions about these historic places, and nobody would know the answer. And he was he was kind of a dick. You know, he was kind of like, "You stupid Americans, you don't know anything. I'm going to ask you another one." And he he almost you know, for all intents and purposes, almost said that. You know, like, you're idiots. You don't know anything in America. So I'm on the bus with the band director and, you know, 30 or 40 other kids and some chaperones. Come around the corner and there's this big statue of this guy, one of the, one of the kings or something like that. And they said, he said, um, he's sitting there on, that, on his throne and he has his, um, has his finger in the pages of a book. And... Uh, uh, in that book, that page he's turned to is to the person who invented the flush toilet. Does anybody know the name of the person who invented the flush toilet? So, of course, everybody on the bus is silent. But as it turned out, my father um, had actually told me this. We had had this discussion, I don't know, a couple weeks earlier. So out of the back of the bus, here I am. I scream at the top of my lungs, crapper! And everybody in the bus turns around and looks at me. The band director turns around, looks at me. I said, I'm serious, crapper! And they're all shaking their head and the guy, like in this like quiet little voice, he goes, Sir Thomas Crapper. So the whole bus goes crazy and all that stuff. That's a good story, that was pretty good. I was right. It was finally one of the American kids actually had a, a bit of knowledge. Yeah, they would do that. I'd go to the go to the store or the restaurant. I'd say, I'd like to have a milkshake. So they would give you a, 
uh, milk with flavoring in it because you're supposed to ask for like a frappe or some bullshit like that, not, not milk. With it. And so, okay, well then good, I want a hamburger. So they give me a, 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 a bun with a piece of ham on it. Oh, you meant a beef burger. Arch. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff like that. Here's another good story. It's a good one. Um, some of you know I'm a financial advisor. And I would, every once in a while, sell enough to win these little trips that you get to go on back in the day. They don't do them so much now. But one of them was a, a, a cruise from, uh, from Paris down to uh, Portugal and um, Spain and France and all that stuff. So we went to, I think it was, where is, where is the, uh, the Geary Museum, I think, in Bilbao, in Bilbao, Spain, Bilbao. Is it Bilbao, Spain? I think it is. And there's a Frank Gehry, like, uh, you know, the guy that designs all those really cool wavy buildings, and there's a really beautiful museum that he's designed there. And um, gross, lettuce and pine, beetroot and pineapple, it's disgusting. Is the hamburger made with beetroot and pineapple? Or is it made with hamburger that's got pineapple on it? That's like pizza. I mean, I, I can't have pizza with the, the, the pineapple on it. It doesn't, it's not made for that. It's not good. It's not good. So anyway, we're at um, the Geary Museum in Bilbao. It's beautiful. And one of the exhibits in it is a, I think the guy's last name might even be Caller, but I don't think it is. But there's a guy that makes huge steel sculptures, like 40 and 50 foot tall, big huge sheets of, of, of like two inch thick steel. And he bends them and stuff like that. And, and there's this one exhibit in this place where there is even maybe taller than 30 feet tall. There are these two parallel sheets of steel that go like this and they sort of wave and they're probably 100 yards, 200 yards long and 30 feet tall. And what you do is you walk between the two um, sheets of steel and it's supposed to be evocative of um, walking in the streets of Europe where they have these really tall old streets and you hear people talking but you don't see them and it echoes off of things. And the room that it is in is incredibly reverberative. I mean like a super echo chamber. So on these trips that I would take, um, I would always bring a pocket trumpet. I don't know if you've seen a pocket trumpet, it's literally a trumpet about this big. And I'd carry it around in his black bag, and it looked like a video camera on the outside. So, you know, they're very strict and stuffy, all the guards in these places, you know, and they don't shh quiet and, you know, don't make any noise. And, you know, be reverent of all the art that you're experiencing and all this. Richard, Sarah, perfect. So, here we are in this place, and I'm thinking to myself, and I got my horn in this bag that I'm carrying around, I'm thinking, man. The horn would just sound ridiculous in this room. I mean, it was like a super echo chamber. So here I am walking between these two sheets of steel and I stop in the middle of it and I take out my horn and I start playing. And the whole room is filled with horn sound. I mean, ridiculously loud and echoey and all this stuff. Then I play for about two minutes. I put it back in zip that up in the bag and like I'm walking out the other end of this sculpture and all the guards you watch everybody running around like ants like what was that where is that where's that coming from and I'm looking around like I'm looking where did that come from wow that was weird and everybody that was with me all the all the financial advisors knew that it was me because I was you know they I would play my horn on the on the cruise ship all the time and they knew I was a horn player so that was kind of funny I enjoyed that quite a bit that was good I used to do that, and, and then one time we stopped in uh, in um, in Lisbon, and um, 
I would go shopping, you know, wearing my Tommy Bahama shirt and all this stuff and uh, buy some really cool things. And, and then I decided at noon, there's all these people in the center of the street there eating. And I, I had my pocket trumpet again and, and I sat down in front of them all and I put my hat down on the street and I started playing like for money. And this, this insurance, you know, you know, here I am with like a, I just bought something at one a really nice store and I had the bag next to me and I'm wearing my Tommy Bahama shirt. But here I am begging for money on the street. And when I get done, <clears throat> the guy I was with says, all right, now go around all the tables and, and ask, for, uh, ask for tips. So I, take, I was actually wearing a beret and I took, took my hat off. I'm going around all the tables going, abrogado, abrogado, abrogado with my horn. And I ended up making like 300 euros and four free beers. I almost stayed off the boat. I, was, I made more money that one afternoon. It paid for the tip of the, the cabin person that was helping me on the boat. It was like ridiculous. So much money. It was crazy. Just going around all the tables, abrogado, abrogado, like I'm some local kid with my Tommy Bahama shirt. That was fun. That's another music story. All right, I'm going to play some more. I think. All right. I guess will be this will be the last song. Oh wait. I had a couple more Aussie phrases. I think. Better than a ham sandwich. Better than a kick up the backside. You'd prefer a fair whack. Does that sound uh, right about Lisa? How about? Toads, banana benders, cockies, sand gropers, and crow eaters. Those are favorite ways Aussies disparage those who live elsewhere. Tropical Queensland has many more bananas and cane toads than people, so they're branded banana benders or cane toads. Queenslanders get their own back, calling Sydney ciders cockroaches in honor of the omnipresent nuclear immune pest found around the harbor city. Is that right? South Australians, particularly early settlers, partake in the delicacy of crow eating. I don't like that. I love crows. While Western Australians spend their lives groping sand. Yeah, put a sock in it. Tell somebody to shut up. That's us. Do the Harry. That's a good one. What is do the Harry? Oh, so when you have your mosey on or get the hell out of here, you do the bolt or the Harry bolt or simply you do the Harry. Oi for drongos and galas. Be nice. You Careful now. There's a lot of Mexicans here on this now. Oi for Drongos and Galas, chanted three times after Aussie, 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 oi, 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 in perhaps the world's cheesiest national cry. But in normal use, it's mild when you disagree with what someone is saying to convey annoyance, when you're being a Drongo or a Gala. In fact, not native birds, but someone who has rocks in their head doesn't know what they're doing. Blokes and chilas, I guess those are boys and girls. Oh, this is good. I like this one. When you don't have anything to do with someone, you tell him or her, get on your bike, which suggests that he or she leave. Quite the opposite, to hold your horses, which requests someone to stay, or don't get your knickers in a knot, or you tell someone to on your bike, even when they're trying to excuse themselves with well-concocted verse, you tell them to tell your story walking. That's pretty good. Oh, these are good. 
Smako, Garbo, Bo, Paolo, Botlo, and Arvo. O is a suffix to any word it can shorten. When in doubt, throw an O on the end of the word and it's bound to be Australian. Take a break when you smoke is a smoko, smako. Someone who collects garbage is a garbo. A bowling in a community club is a bolo. A bottle shop is a botto, botlo. And the word afternoon with three syllables just doesn't stand a chance. It's evolved or devolved into arvo. That's pretty good. All right, that's it. That's enough Aussie slang, Lisa. Here we go. Last song, I think. I think I'll do a loop thing. Some of you might know what that means. I don't know what's going to happen now. Oh, musician, not Mexican. That's hilarious. Now you're now you're um, you're forgiven.
So that was uh, some looping. Nice. Thanks, Earl. Um, thank you for uh, being with me this far. I suppose I could play Besame Mucho one more time. Just because it's Mexico. And then I'll say goodnight. I already played it earlier. If you've heard it earlier, now you'll hear it again. Well, I hope you all have a very uh, good week next week. I think there's some parts in the United States where you can actually start to go out again. 
And if you're going to actually do that, please be careful. And if you're in parts of the world like here where you can't even buy a beer or go to the beach or go to a restaurant because there's none open, um, enjoy the solitude of it all. And if you're with a partner or several partners, send me a video. <laughs> Just kidding. If <laughs> That was pretty good though. If you're with a partner or whatever, congratulations and I hope you enjoy yourselves. Um, these moments with your friends, with your families. If you're alone, um, enjoy the solitude, feel it. I happen to be amazingly blessed to be here at Casa Acantilado. And I can see the moon and I can see the Venus reflecting across the ocean. And I see Polaris. And I see you. And I'm very, very blessed that you choose to spend a little bit of time here. It's um, very fulfilling for me to be able to do this and share this. And I just want to tell all of you that in the middle of all this, find love for yourself. Find ways to... So I'm going to say goodnight. Josh Sens, haven't seen you in forever. How are you, brother? How are things in Ohio? I hope they're well. You have the greatest family. I've been watching them grow up. It's pretty cool. Josh and I worked together in New York City. Boy, we had some moments in that company. Yes, we did. Some really good times and some really super intense times. Kind of like now, but different. So, I, um, I'll keep doing these. I'm here until the end of May. Love you too, man. May 29th, unless things change and it's even longer. Um, but in the rest of May, and as long as I'm here to uh, sit in this ridiculously beautiful spot, I will continue to uh, play the sun into the water.